You're listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Pond University is your one-stop shop for all things pond management. It is hosted by Mitchell Ziski and Megan Gunn from Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Join us as we talk with biologists, managers and pond owners about the topics and tools needed to manage your pond for good habitat and great fishing. So grab a notebook and a beverage and sit back and enjoy Pond University. Welcome back to Pond University, where we talk about all things Pond. I am one of your hosts, Megan Gunn, and I am joined, as always, by Mitch. How are you doing, Mitch? I'm good, Megan. How are you? I'm good. I'm enjoying the sunshine. Yep. it's The weather's really improved here. It looks like spring is upon us here in, mm-hmm. in Indiana, at least, and, and I'm getting excited for all the things I want to do outside. I agree. One of one of my favorite things about spring is watching the the Wabash River levels change, mm-hmm. and so I was able to go out yesterday. I went to campus and pass the one of the pits, and it was so high, <laughs> incredible. I know incredible. it's, you know, I can you can see that streams and rivers and and ponds are going to be getting a lot of a lot of um, water into them. So mm-hmm. that's a favorite part of spring. That and the flowers blooming. Yeah, the flowers blooming. But, blooming. I like seeing the birds too, um, mm-hmm. and I like getting out fishing in, in uh, soft water. I tried the ice fishing thing once here again this winter, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's uh, interesting, but it's probably not not for me. Um, you know, as a as a long term hobby, so I'm looking forward to getting <laughs> out fishing in in uh, in soft water, not hard water. Yeah, but you tried. Yeah, you tried a new thing. No, it sounds good in theory. Maybe I need to find some better ice fishing spots. And that's exactly why I like electric fishing. Like, you know there's fish there, and then you wait all day and you get nothing, but you put that electricity in there, zoop, and haul the fish. <laughs> yeah, there's, luckily you can't use that for recreational purposes because there probably wouldn't be any fish left. Right. <laughs> yeah. Nice disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, but that's actually a great little segue into what we're going to be talking about today because um, we have a guest coming on the show today who's um, who does a lot of fish management in ponds. And so he's going to talk about some of the ways that you can assess your fish populations in your pond. And, and one of those is, is electrofishing. You know, um, I would assume that most people don't have an electrofishing, you know, electrofishing equipment laying around, but that's something that you can work with um, consultants or your local biologists or even reach out to your local university extension and, and they might be able to um, bring some of their resources out and actually do some electrofishing on your pond to really see what sort of species and, and stuff you have in there. And I'm extra excited to talk to our guest today because he was a student when I was a student. Like, I was about to graduate when he was just starting. And then I went back to the lab to manage it. And he he was an undergraduate researcher the entire time. So it's been cool to see him grow over the years and and see him in this awesome position that he's been in for a while. Yeah. So you, so he has you to thank for all of his success now. You, <laughs> you trained him and molded him <laughs> he he was good on his own i i had a, a little impact there <laughs> yeah so so i guess is uh wes goldsmith he works um for aquatic control which is a um a pond management company um here in indiana and ohio and and maybe a couple of other states here in the midwest uh, and he's specifically in their role of of fish management and so um He's been working with them for a number of years, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about his experiences and some of the training he had at Purdue and, and other places. And, and then we're going to take a dive into, you know, assessing your fish populations, uh, what sort of species you want there, what you don't want there, uh, how you can manage fish in your pond. And then he's going to talk a little bit about some of the common problems that he sees and, and some of the ways that pond owners can fix, fix those problems. Essential Pond Terms, the segment where we hope to expand your vocabulary by defining important terms for pond management. One pond term that you will hear in this episode is rotenone. Rotenone is actually a chemical that is used to kill fish. 
This is a restricted chemical that can only be purchased and used by licensed consultants and biologists. Rotenone is not a species-specific chemical, and when applied to a pond, it usually kills all or most of the fish. As such, rotenone is only used in severe situations to restart a pond. Two other terms you will hear during the podcast is electrofishing and relative weight. Our guest actually does a great job explaining these, so we won't cover them again here. One last term that we will talk about a lot during this episode is harvest. Harvest refers to the removal of fish from a pond and is an essential part of good fish management. While we often like to harvest fish to eat, we sometimes need to harvest small or undesirable fish from a pond to fix fish problems. G'day Wes, how's it going? Good, how are you guys doing? Good. Good. It's good to see you. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, been interesting this spring uh, with everything going on, but it's good to get out and see some of you guys. Obviously know both of you from being at Purdue, so I'm mm-hmm. sure we'll talk some about that. But Yeah, yeah, Megan, you know, she just, just mentioned that you're, uh, you're an alum of Purdue and you went through our program. And so, yeah, tell us a little bit, you know, how you got started in – in fisheries, aquatic science and stuff, you know, tell us a bit about your time at Purdue and, and mm-hmm. then what you're doing now and how long you've been, been at aquatic right. control. So <clears throat> I remember it goes all the way back to, to high school, really. I remember sitting in a uh, in an ag class reading a Bassmaster magazine. So I'm big into fishing and, and that kind of stuff. So I remember reading an article in the very back of this magazine and it was written by a fisheries biologist Um, and so that was the first kind of eye-opening thing that kind of led me down the path of even letting me know that this was any kind of career path uh, to pursue at that point I didn't really I knew that I liked to be outside fishing this was as a sophomore in high school so way earlier than most people are lucky enough to figure out what they want to do I would say but um, so from that point, just kind of started researching, uh, what I needed to do to, to do something like this, um, found Purdue pretty quickly. Um, I'm from Southeastern Indiana. And so, um, only, a, you know, a couple hours North on the other side of the state, but so, you know, at that time, Indiana only had a few options and Purdue, you know, seemed to be the best option at that time. Um, I think still is from my understanding. Um, but there's more, it seems like there's more programs now, um, than there were, you know, when I was coming through, but so applied to Purdue and got in, uh, spent four years, <clears throat> uh, getting a fisheries and aquatic sciences degree. Uh, went through all the program, the summer camp, you know, um, I helped out, you know, did a lot of work with Megan and Dr. Goforth, you know, in the lab, uh, was a part of our, um, American fishery society chapter there. And so tried to be involved, um, as much as I could. And then through a couple different summers, I think, uh, I spent one whole summer working with you and, um, Dr. Goforth in the lab. And then the following summer was a fisheries aid for the Indiana DNR, um, down in Southern Indiana. Um, and then the following summer after that, I graduated and really being a state biologist is what I thought, you know, just always pictured that I would do, um, aquatic control, you know, my supervisor now actually came in and did a talk, um, you know, to our AFS club. And so that was kind of, the first I had really thought about the private industry, but at that time we did a little bit of fisheries work. Or I say we aquatic control at that time um, was doing a little bit of fisheries work, but mostly was doing the plant and algae, uh, you know, nuisance vegetation treatments and that kind of stuff. And so I wasn't sure I wanted, you know, I wanted to make sure that I was going to be getting to play with fish every summer, <laughs> is basically what I was trying to do. So Um, still thought, you know, the DNR, uh, whether it was Indiana or wherever would be where I would end up. So I decided to do another summer in a different district in central Indiana. And there, um, both stints with the DNR, the assistant biologist left to a, a different job. And so it was basically me and the district biologist to get all the work done 
well, the first summer was down in Southern Indiana. There's a big rivers biologist down there, <clears throat> similar situation. So it was me, um, the assistant rivers biologist and the district fish management biologist at the time to get all the lake management work done and all of the big rivers work done for the whole summer. That's a lot. Uh, so yeah, it was, <laughs> but it was a great opportunity because typically, you know, what the assistants would be getting to do, um, I got to do more than an intern would typically get to mm -hmm. do okay. is, is basically what I'm saying. Yeah. So that turned out to be a really good opportunity. Um, then the following summer, you know, the same kind of thing happened. The, the office that I was at was also at Sakana fish hatchery, which is a state hatchery in Martinsville. Uh, well, they were shorthanded that summer and our assistant, Lake, the assistant, uh, biologist left for a different job um up in indianapolis so now i was in a similar situation where i got to do a lot more with the lake management biologist and i got to help out with the hatchery okay um so both times kind of lucked out um and got to do a lot of extra stuff and stayed there for you know as an aide they can't keep you on uh, forever so eventually they you know you have to move on and so towards the end of that i found a job out in arizona um, and that was actually for a private company called Martian Associates and basically a small private company started by a professor uh, named Dr. Paul Marsh. He was a professor at Arizona State University um, in Tempe, Arizona, there around Phoenix. And basically, you know, his company and they still do today, there's a lot of endangered fish species out West. And so there's a lot of government work that needs done and not enough biologists to do it. So there's a couple of different small companies that basically uh, bid on these jobs. And then the government gives that contract to them. And then they do the work, whether it's a three or four year project. And, you know, then we would write a whole big, uh, you know, there'd be annual reports, but basically at the end of the project, you write a big report you know, and then submit that to the, you know, the feds essentially, okay, uh, or different government agencies, whoever's having that work done. So that was, you know, a lot different, um, you know, than what I do now and what the DNR does around here. Um, it was more similar to what we did at Purdue doing very research based stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as that goes out in the, you know, on the Colorado river up in Utah, um, got to see a lot of cool stuff out there. I bet. Um, uh, yeah, I loved it out there. It was hard to, hard to come back, but we moved back to, you know, start a family, get a little closer to home. And a few of my classmates from Purdue, uh, were already working here. They kind of started here pretty fresh out of, you know, graduation. Okay. And uh, so I was really just looking for a job. I knew at the time, you know, I didn't know how much fish work it was going to be. But, you know, what I tell a lot of people when you're trying to find a career in fisheries, if you apply for 10 jobs, it's probably in six different states mm -hmm. where yeah. a lot of other fields, <clears throat> you can move to a city and there's several jobs in your field to, you know, to apply for. So when we came back and knew we wanted to, you know, live in a fairly small area, there was only so many opportunities. And so I reached out here. And so I've been here at aquatic control since July of 2017. Okay. Um, and have essentially, they knew my background and that kind of thing. And so they knew they wanted to, uh, you know, start to focus a little more time on the fish management stuff. And so, you know, over the last three and a half years that uh, they've basically, uh, you know, given me more and more time and more and more freedom to, you know, try to build our program here. Um, and so that's kind of what I do now <clears throat> is I oversee all the fish management work, you know, across our seven offices throughout the Midwest. That's okay. really uh, cool, Wes. Yeah. 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 That's, it's been a lot of fun. I think, um, you know, if there's anybody listening who maybe, you know, when we have, we have some younger listeners in high school or, you know, thinking about college or maybe some of our listeners have kids or grandkids that they want to, you know, 
I'll say push gently push towards the fisheries <laughs> field. You know, yeah. I think yeah. you know Wes just gave a great outline of, of what you can do once you get into a a good school and, and take advantage of some of the the opportunities. You know, you got to find the opportunities and put in the work to apply for them and stuff. But when you get those opportunities, you can really get some great experiences, and then you can use those experiences to to build a career that you're really interested in. So. And what if you hadn't gone to that meeting where your now supervisor was speaking, you know, like, yeah, right. Even... Out on today. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about aquatic control? You know, some, some of our listeners <clears throat> might, might be familiar with it. Um, you know what they do. And then you mentioned that you've really tried to expand some of their fish work. So, so tell us a little bit right. about the company in general and then how the fish stuff, um, fits in and, and what you're trying to do with fish management. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so aquatic control, uh, our headquarters is here in Seymour, Indiana, um, but we have seven total offices. So Seymour, Indiana, Evansville, Indiana, which is down in the, you know, southern Indiana, Valparaiso, Indiana, which is all the way in the northern part. Then we have um, Elizabethtown, Kentucky, um, Canton, Illinois is a newer one. Well, there's one just west of St. Louis in Missouri, which has been there for a while. And then another newer one is down in um, Memphis, Tennessee. Wow. So, so we, you know, we, it's, we're actually one of the oldest um, pond and lake management companies around, um, you know, throughout the country from my understanding, but basically you know, the biggest part of our business is, like I mentioned earlier, treating uh, nuisance algae and vegetation, uh, you know, in pri- mostly private waters. We do work with different state agencies, the Indiana DNR, on some of the natural lakes and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of it is on private lakes, whether they have an HOA or something like that, down to you know, a quarter acre pond that, you know, someone dug themselves, you know, and is in their backyard, you know, just your typical farm pond. So um, helping people out with that uh, kind of, uh, you know, keep their pond well manicured. A lot of times as I'm sure you guys, if you haven't already, we'll talk about the longer a body of water ages, the more nutrients it builds up. And so a lot of, you know, it gets harder and harder to keep under control. And so there's things we can do and come in and help treat some of the, the harder to work with, um, you know, algaes and vegetation, that kind of stuff. So that's a really big section. You know, we've been doing that kind of stuff for a long time. Um, another section of the company is, uh, so like fountains and aeration. Mm -hmm. So anything you see, you know, from a fountain that, you know, shoots water up in the air as like a decorative thing, down to, you know, more of a surface aerator that still, you know, looks, works, functions as a, as a fountain, but just moves a lot more water, kind of a surface aerator for ponds that are, you know, shallower than eight foot all the way down to a diffused aeration system, um, you know, coming from the bottom. And so we have a whole, you know, there's guys that only focus on that, especially here at headquarters and some of our other bigger offices have guys that are, you know, they're out doing maintenance on that kind of stuff or installing new ones. Uh, so that's pretty significant portion. Um, and then we do some other stuff, you know, like bathymetric mapping, um, okay. you know, different, some other real, you know, smaller, smaller parts that fit in. And then, um, like I said, what I do now is, um, you know, overseeing the fish management side of things. So that would include, uh, electrofishing surveys, which we'll talk about today. Um, we work with hatcheries all over, um, all over the Midwest. So we can help, you know, provide stocking plans for a new pond or an existing pond. Um, we do fish eradication, you know, each state's a little different how they, uh, whether they let us do that kind of stuff. We're using rote known, um, you know, if you have carp or any kind of problematic fish, mm-hmm. Um, where you just have to scrap it and start over. We do that kind of stuff or just electrofishing removals. Uh, we have a project in Kentucky where we'll, um, you know, we can't use rote known for various reasons, budget and some other stuff. So we'll come in and, re- you know, each year based on the, you know, the fishing club's budget, we'll just come in and remove as many carp as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot, you know, there's a lot of different stuff that, 
um, habitat, you know, that's a big one, fish food and, and feeder. So all that kind of falls under uh, what I oversee now uh, for all of our offices. Um, and it all kind of, you know, goes together when we're, you know, get down to it and working with the client. Great. That's, that's a great overview of, of the company and particularly what you do. And I know that, um, you know, a lot of, you know, vegetation management is, is a big part of pond management. Um, but, uh, you know, I would say that a lot of people who have ponds have them for fish and for fishing. And, and so mm-hmm. I think, um, you know, the, the fish and fish management is in, important because it's important for the, the end outcomes that these landowners want. Sure, they might have vegetation problems they have to deal with, but it's the fish that's sort of the end point in, and good fishing is, is that end point they want. So, Yeah, and that brings up, you know, a good a good topic is just the goals. So, I mean, we're treating, um, you know, our pond management division is treating everything from uh, that retention pond outside the Walmart, you know, next to the Walmart parking mm-hmm. lot, all the way to, you know, someone's pond that they dug because they want to, you know, grow trophy bass and bring their friends and family out there. So the goals of our customers varies, you know, tremendously. And so, that's really one of the biggest things that we have to start with when we get a phone call and they're asking for a service. You know, the first question that I always ask is, well, you know, what are your goals for the body of water? What's your typical day? You know, if you can picture in the future, you know, what do you want to do on the pond? If it doesn't involve fishing, um, that's fine. You can do, there's ways to, to treat your pond and, and do different things that, you know, doesn't really uh benefit the fish but it's going to make it look like a well manicured pond that some people want to have and then other people for me you know if i have a pond i want algae and i want it to almost look nasty because i like to throw a topwater frog right so i'm going (laughs) to throw an artificial frog that floats on all that nasty looking stuff and then the bass are going to bust up through it. And that's what I picture when I, you know, want to go fishing. That's what I look for, but that's not what everybody looks for. And so you have to figure out, uh, you know, what is their ideal day, you know, around the pond? What does that look like? And then we go down the path of, okay, so what do we do next? And I think we've talked about that on every single episode with every one of our guests that, especially with, with, new pond owners or enthusiasts think about your goals first and then work from there because if you don't have a goal in mind it it's going to be a mess <laughs> yeah there's just a lot yeah you and that's sometimes hard you know for me as the you know as the pond manager trying to get that out of a a lot of times like ah, oh, we just want to go fishing and we want to go uh and we want to go swimming and it's just like all right give me some like let's talk in detail like Mm -hmm. what do you really want do you like to bass fish do you like to bluegill fish um are there going to be kids fishing or do you have a buddy you know all your friends and family are hardcore bass fishermen you know let's try to really talk about uh spend some time having a conversation what do you really want to do uh you know, at the pond. And then, you know, there's, there's different things you can do to try to at least lean, lean everything in that direction. Um, instead of just saying, well, we have these broad goals, um, and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think too, the, you know, not having specific goals, not only helps you, you know, tailor your management in a certain direction, but it also gives you something to measure the success of your management against, right? Like if you if you say, right, I want it, I want trophy bass fishing. That helps you choose your practices. But then in a couple of years' time, how, are you work? Are you achieving that? Are you catching bigger bass? Mm-hmm. If not, then you can go back and adjust things. And I like what that you mentioned. Specific fish have different needs, and so if you want to get bluegill, you're going to have to manage your pond this way. And if you want to get bass, it's a it's a different process. <laughs> Pond Species Profile, the segment where we will showcase the biology and ecology of popular and not so popular pond species. In this episode, we will profile crappie. There are two species of crappie, white crappie and black crappie. Crappie are a popular panfish in reservoirs and lakes and can grow to more than 15 inches and 3 pounds. Despite their popularity, crappie are not often recommended for ponds 
particularly ponds less than five acres in size. In ponds, crappie will often compete with bass for food, causing issues with your bass populations. Crappie may also eat small bass fry, causing issues with reproduction. In many cases, crappie will grow too large for bass to eat and can quickly overpopulate a pond. If you have a larger pond and you're interested in stocking crappie, we recommend that you work with a professional to minimize the risk of issues down the track. Okay, so um, I think that's a, you know, a good starting point for us thinking about fish. You know, I think these management goals, you, you, you know, really you should be thinking about those with all pond management you do, vegetation, uh, nutrient reduction, aeration, and, and also fish. Um, but let's say, um, you know, we, we covered a little bit, you know, we've covered some new pond, ma some, some new pond construction and new pond stocking stuff in the past, and, and we can link to those previous episodes. But, um, but, you know, I think a lot of people are in the situation where maybe they buy a new property that's got a pond on it, or they've got a pond that they've sort of neglected for a little while. Um, and so what's, you know, say they've got some idea of what they want out of that pond in terms of their fish goals, you know, what are some of the first steps that they can take? Um, to, to manage that pond. Right. So, <clears throat> yeah. So like you said, start with the goals from there. What you really need to do is figure out where you're at now. Um, and you, you bring up a good point about, but you said after someone buys a property, um, one thing that we, I don't think we get enough of if you're thinking about buying a property and the pond is the main focus or lake, you can have someone like aquatic control or, you know, private pond and lake management company come and do an electrofishing survey. That way, you know what you're getting. Um, you know, whoever's selling it, they're going to tell you, you know, oh, the fishing's great, right? We <laughs> hear it all the time. But no, everyone always calls us after they buy it. Uh, we did one down around Evansville this past year where the guy just bought it and he was told it was 10 foot deep and he was told there was this and that in it. And it was just turned out to be the complete opposite of what oh, no. um, a lot of river fish and, you know, it mm -hmm. was just, it was, uh, it was hard to sit there on the boat and show him and explain to him like this, you know, this is going to be an uphill battle trying to, you know, get much out of this. And he had, I mean, I don't know what he spent on it, but, um, so that's something to think about if, if the main reason you're buying a piece of property is that body of water, it, you know it would be worth the investment to just have someone come out there and check it, get a, a quick report um, and see what your starting point is. And, you know, see if the seller is really, uh, you know, knows, you know, it's not to say that they're lying. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times people will catch a, a huge bass 10 years ago and they just think that he's <laughs> still in there and that everything ponds change within a couple of years when they're left unmanaged. So, um, so that's something to think about, but I think that's a great point you bring up. And I think, you know, if we're buying a house, we'll get that house inspected first, you know, for right. its structural, mm -hmm. you know, integrity and stuff like that. And, and a lot, you're right. A lot of people buy properties with ponds on them specifically for fishing in that pond. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think getting them, getting them evaluated is a great idea. And I think taking that a step further, if you have a pond and, and you're thinking about management and stuff like that, if you have management plan, ongoing management plans and, and regular surveys and, and information, you know, really good understanding of your pond, not only can that help you with your management, but if you ever want to go and sell your property, that could really add value to your property because you've got these records to, say, to show what you know, what your pond is and, and, mm -hmm. and stuff like yeah. that. So I know, I know we've covered that in past episodes where, where, you know, a, a well-managed pond can really add value to your pop property and a poorly managed pond mm -hmm. can actually detract mm -hmm. value from your property. So, right. um, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so say someone's, you know, they've got this pond and they're looking to, to get started with fish management. What, you know, what are the next steps for them? Right. So what you can do yourself, um, really you just have to start fishing um and i know you guys have recently you know come up with um you know some documents and different stuff to help you you know make a management plan and and have a starting point but that's really what you have to do you just have to go fishing i always tell people um you know again i go back you know thinking about myself is the easiest way to to think about others mm -hmm. i like to bass fish i don't spend a whole lot of time uh, you know, bluegill fishing or even crappie fishing unless, you know, a couple times a year. 
but when you're trying to manage your pond you want to try to fish for at least take the time occasionally fish for everything you know that's out there use live bait use artificial um that way you can get a more broad idea of you know of what you have in the pond um so you'll want to you know keep track of you know, even if you just write it down, write down the size. Um, if you can measure and weigh, that's even better. Um, we'll talk about um, some length weight relationships in a little bit when we, when I get into, you know, what we do at, you know, some mm -hmm. of our surveys, but uh, some of that you can do, do on your own. If you, if you weigh and measure, um, you can look at length weight relationships, will, which will tell you, you know, the health the health of that fish, but really we use them as clues for the whole fishery. And so they can kind of indicate other things that are going on. Um, so yeah, just go fishing, start paying attention, uh, look for, you know, the common issues that we run into are, you know, that everybody talks about are stunted fish. And so if you're catching a lot of bass in one size class and, you know, very few out of that, out of that size range, um, that should be a clue that, you know, hey, we might need to harvest some fish in this size class or, um, you know, or even the bluegill, if all of your bluegill are, you know, five inches or less and there's very few bass in the pond, um, you know, you probably have stunted bluegill and those are kind of hindering the, the bass reproduction. Um, and so there's things you can do from there. So mm -hmm. really, you just have to start fishing. Um, and pay attention while you're out there, what you're catching, how many different size classes are you, are you seeing, um, you know, different things like that. And then when you start to piece it all together, you can, uh, you can pick different things out. And so, yeah, I think you're right. You know, people going fishing is the best way for people to, um, to, to see what's going on in their pond. I think a key to that is keeping some records, you know, like it can be as simple yeah. as taking photos on your phone next to a ruler or something. Right. Um, but if you, you know, if you don't keep records, you know, you might think you remember what it was, but if you, over the space of a couple of months, if you, if you catch 20, 30 fish, you may not actually know the, the size of all those fish right. or remember all those. So keep yep. some records. And if you're interested in, in looking at some of the other fish or some smaller fish sizes in your ponds, you can do things like throw a cast net or, you know, drag a bait mm -hmm. net or, or even put some fish, right. little minnow traps out can be good at catching, you know, juvenile sunfish. So Mm -hmm. There are some ways, you know, you, you made a good point about trying to um, use a diversity of baits and techniques to catch a range of fish. And I think you could use, you know, if it's, if you've already got a, a minnow trap or something you can toss out there, you might be able to get a, a sense of, of what the small fish in your pond look like too. Yeah. And, and that brings up um, something that I taught, you know, at, at the pond clinics and stuff that I've done that I talk about, you can, there's just visual things, um, you can look for. So like through the middle of the summer, your blue, you should be seeing bluegill spawn. You know, the, the big waves come up about every full moon through the warmer months of the year. You should see your bluegill spawning beds, you know, come fill up for a little while. And then when you, when you get away from that full moon, it'll kind of thin out. And then the next full, moon, you know, you should see those fish kind of coming and going the bluegill. Um, and so through the summer, you should be looking for small little bluegill. I remember when I was, you know, treating a several ponds before, you know, I was doing what I am now, just focusing solely on the, on the fishery stuff. But when I would roll up to a pond and get out and start to get my boat ready and all that kind of stuff, there's things that you can see right away. Um, you know, through the summer, you should see, uh, little schools of bluegill because there's, like I said, every full moon there, some of the bluegill in the pond are going to be spawning. So you should look for that, or you can look for that reproduction. And so if you see a bunch of little bluegill, you know, through the summer around, you know that you're having some successful spawning events. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't see that and you see little, I always call them wolf packs of largemouth <laughs> bass. So little groups of like five or six largemouth, whether they're you know, all eight inches or they're all 15 inches, you're going to see those. And in that case, you typically will not see all the little bluegill around because all that's basically indicating you have too many bass and they're eating those bluegill as soon as they hatch out. Mm -hmm. Um, so just there's visual things if you, and every pond's different, but as a pond owner, you can kind of get to know, you know, every year what to expect around this time. What are we seeing? 
and then that is also you know over time like you said keeping records um you'll notice if something changes like oh man it seems like the last few years we really had a lot of little bluegill but now i'm seeing more little bass and those bluegill have kind of disappeared that could be a cue that okay we might need to up our harvest our bass harvest and maybe lay off the bluegill or you know different things that can clue you in mm-hmm. um to what's going on you don't even always have to have your hands on the fish but um, just paying attention to everything going on in the pond can make a big difference. And one thing Mitch and I were talking about just before you came on is it it takes it takes a long time to fish and you may not get anything. And so I personally prefer electric fishing because mm-hmm. you know that you're going to get some fish, especially if they're there, but they are usually right. there. Um, right. And so you have to have a special permit to fish and a regular regular Joe or Jane can't get a, can't get mm-hmm. like a fishing unit right. or permit. And so that's where companies like aquatic control come in. There's different scenarios where it can really make a big difference. The first one we talked about, like if you're going to buy a property or you just did, I think it makes a lot of sense just to get a starting point. Um, the other one, they have really lofty goals. So like if you're like we talked about earlier, if you're truly talking about trophy bass, um, there's a lot that goes into that. And so having, having, you know, someone help out and, you know, give guidance and come see where you're at, um, you know, makes a lot of sense, but you know, there's times when you can do it yourself, but there, we get a lot of people that, um, you know, they're busy with work schedules and that kind of thing. And they have the resources to have us come do it. Um, and it, it's not ex- extremely expensive, but the one thing to keep in mind is the electrofishing doesn't really solve the problems. It's just creating, excuse me, you're just there to create a plan. And then what you do from there is really going to solve the problems. But um, so <clears throat> what we do when we do an electrofishing survey, um, it actually includes water quality. We'll kind of touch on your habitat. Um, and then we, we start to look at the fish. And so we'll take a water sample, um, bring that to our lab and we'll check for nutrients. So phosphorus and nitrogen, alkalinity, hardness, and pH, um, are the main things, um, depending where you're at in the country or even within the state of Indiana, there's areas where that's really important. And then there's areas where, you know, you typically are going to be okay as far as water quality goes and your alkalinity and stuff. So like for Indiana listeners, um, for example, Brown County area down in Southern Indiana, um, we see a lot of really lower pH alkalinity hardness. And so then that comes with a little bit more of a challenge and uh, nothing you can't overcome, but just, you know, that water quality really becomes as important as important as anything. Um, so then after we take that water sample, we'll launch the boat um, and basically shock around the shoreline. And so we have a generator in the boat. We have electro fishing box um, that we can manipulate the wattage and all that kind of stuff. Um, and basically the electricity is emitted through, through the water just in front of the boat. Um, so you have two booms that kind of go out six, eight feet in front of the boat. And then there's a field created from those two booms you know, to the bottom of your boat. And then you'll have a netter up front and you'll just go around the shoreline. It doesn't, a lot of times people think as soon as we turn it on, like all the fish are going to come up. Um, that's definitely not what happens. We've had uh, a lack of communication occasionally and have disappointed customers that like <laughs> thousands of fish didn't just roll up at one time. So, um, but we're going to, you know, go along the shoreline, shock through the habitat, um, collect as many fish as we can, every different species we see, um, bring those into the boat and, uh, they're just temporarily stunned. So they kind of roll over on their belly a little bit and we don't even catch, you know, we don't even catch every fish we see. They, um, if they're kind of on the outskirts of the, of the electro, you know, the electricity, uh, that field that we're creating, we don't always catch all of them. So, by the time we get done shocking and the, you know, the fish are in the tub, a lot of them are back up swimming. And by the time we're done measuring they're you know, they're back to swimming around in the pond. So, um, we'll take length and weight measurements on a big portion of them. Um, and then they go back. And so we record all of that data. 
Um, while we're doing that, we kind of keep an eye on what kind of habitat you have. Um, and so there's a whole section in the report that talks about, um, you know, how your habitat is influencing what's going on in the pond as well. So then, then, you know, we take all that data, we, um, look at everything. We'll look at, uh, length weight is a big one. So I don't know if you guys have talked about relative weight. Uh, um, we haven't yet. No. Yeah. So that, <clears throat> that's a big one. Um, so the easiest way I've found to explain it is a fish of a given length, uh, should weigh, you know, a certain weight based on its health and how it's doing. And so they've come up with this equation by looking at thousands and thousands of, of, of bass or any, they have these, this equation for several different species. And so we do it on bluegill and bass. If we have a customer that has something, um, you know, if they have walleye in their pond or something a little bit different, you know, we'll run the equation on them as well. But, um, bass are the biggest one that we found tells a huge part of the story, largemouth bass, just in your typical, um, you know, farm pond fishery. Um, and the reason that is because they're the top end predator. And so everything kind of leads up to them and has a big impact on them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, back to the relative weight, a 14 inch fish should weigh, I think it's like 1.47, basically a pound and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we catch a 14 inch largemouth and he weighs one and a half pounds, he has a 100% relative weight. If he has, uh, less than that, then he has less than a hundred percent relative weight. And we know, you know, he's not 100% perfectly healthy and we can try to deduct reasons why that might be. If he's over one and a half pounds, then he's over a hundred percent relative weight and he's really kicking butt. We know <laughs> that he's doing good and, you know, we want to make sure, um, you know, he's can go back in the pond and we can figure out why is this working well, make sure we, you know, keep it that way. So, you know, a huge portion of the surveys that we do end up with stunted bass, way too many bass in the ponds and all their relative weights are down, you know, 70, 80%, okay. which means they're extremely skinny. Um, and so what's going on there is they just, there's too many mouths to feed basically. And so you don't have bluegills, the biggest, most important, uh, forage species you're going to have in a, in your typical pond. Um, and so what happens a lot of times if you don't have proper management like harvest and and even habitat has a big uh, you know plays a big role you get too many bass they start to eat you know eat the bluegill out of the system um and so you'll <clears throat> what you'll find and you know you guys listening can go fishing in your pond and and look for this scenario because a lot of people have it um it if you're catching a lot of largemouth bass between it can happen in different size ranges, but I'll give you a broad size of all the way down to eight and really severe scenarios all the way up to, you know, 15, even 16 inches sometimes. And they all fall within a three to four inch range. They're all underweight. What you'll find in your bluegill, bluegill population, most of the time, you'll still have kind of a, a good top end of your bluegill. So we'll say seven inches or better. You'll have a, a, a nice group of bluegill that are doing okay. They seem to be growing okay. Um, and then in your middle size classes, say like three to six inches will be very scarce. Okay. Because those, those bass are the predators, right? They're eating those individuals. Mm -hmm. And then depending on the severity of the situations, a lot of times you'll have a lot of bluegill less than three inches because those are just coming off the beds all summer long. Bluegill are spawning several times through the year. And so they're providing food, but when you have too many bass, the bass are eating bluegill at a size that's basically too small. You know, for a bass to grow properly, they need the right size food to keep them you know, to keep them growing in the, you know, and heading in the right direction. If a 15 inch bass is having to eat a two and a half, three inch bluegill, he has to eat tons and tons of them to get in enough calories to put on weight and to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Ideally that fish is eating a five to six inch bluegill and he doesn't have to spend so much energy. He's only has to catch a few of those fish a day, 
you know, to put on some weight and keep growing. So what happens when you get too many bass, they're constantly chasing around tiny, tiny little bluegill. They're not getting too many, you know, very many calories mm -hmm. back in return. So it's like, it becomes an energy equation. Like how, how much energy do they have to spend to catch their food? Um, and so that's what we see a lot of people run into and for different reasons. One of the biggest being, uh, just not harvesting enough bass. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's an interesting scenario you've outlined there. It's quite it's probably the opposite of most of us during COVID. We're expending very little energy, <laughs> but eating lots of calories. Yeah. So then that's kind of like what during pond clinics and stuff, what I always uh, try to explain it like if you have to climb all the way to the top of the mountain just to pick up one little bite of food um, or you can just get up off your couch and go grab a cheeseburger and then sit back down on the couch like we want the guy getting up off the couch and grabbing a cheeseburger that's what we want our fish to be doing we don't want them to have to run a marathon just to get you know a little snack yeah. to get a banana at the end yeah exactly the, one time in a pond clinic i i said to get a french fry and one guy's like well I've, you know people who eat french fries that it's kind of uh fattening isn't it i was like okay how about a carrot like i don't know <laughs> just, that's not the point but <laughs> i think if you climb to the top of the mountain you can probably eat whatever you like and you're not gonna be, yeah. be putting on too much weight but um yep. it's interesting yep. that you you describe that scenario i think you did a great job sort of outlining a common scenario that people have and you know we have a um we have a, a purdue extension publication that talks a lot about fish management and and um we we outline a few different scenarios there and and the scenario you just mentioned is is really what someone would would strive for if they were trying to grow large bluegill, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, because absolutely. That, that way they've got they've got a whole bunch of bass running around eating the mid-sized bluegill, freeing up space for or for a few of them to grow really large. <clears throat> yes. And so so that that is a scenario that some people might want. It goes back to your goals, mm -hmm. but for most people who want a general good fishing pond or want a bass focused fishing pond, the scenario you described is probably not going to be very um, ideal for them. Right. And the complete opposite end of the spectrum from what I just described, the opposite of that would be closer and closer to a trophy bass scenario uh, where you have very, very few bass. Um, so the bluegill are reproducing and not, you know, there's tons and tons of bluegill out there, which the bluegill actually, um, you know, through nest predation and stuff, you know, force your, your bass at some point, uh, where their reproduction is very low. And so you, uh, we do find ponds in that scenario as well. They, a lot of time, a balanced scenario, uh, is hard to stay in. And so if you just let, if you just, you can take, you know, I don't know what the odds would be, but if you take 10 ponds that are all in the exact same scenario and just let them all play out, uh, very few, if any, will just stay in a balanced mm -hmm. state. Eventually, Mother Nature is going to lean it towards bass heavy or towards bluegill heavy. And they just, those scenarios kind of, um, they lend themselves farther and farther down the spectrum. And so the opposite end of a bass crowded is bluegill crowded, which provides tons of food for your bass, um, but it doesn't allow them to reproduce very well. And so that's how you get, uh, you know, that's one you know, way in one part of a trophy fishery is um, just reducing your bass population so much that you have tons and tons of food. Uh, you know, there's other th other things to it. You, if the bluegill get too stunted, you know, then you're back to we don't have the optimal size mm -hmm. forage. Um, but you know, those are two kind of scenarios that can kind of play themselves out. The longer something goes unmanaged, we've we've found bass crowded ponds where the the biggest bass we catch is nine and a half inches and they're just all some of those fish are you know whatever seven years old wow and they're hmm. you know nine inches long because they just they're basically just eating their own young uh you know cannibalizing because it's so there's just no food out mm -hmm. there for them um so i think another thing that 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 scenario these scenarios highlight for for fish management in ponds is the importance of that predator prey interaction mm -hmm. right like if you if you have a pond where you have one species of fish in it it could be bass it could be bluegill it could be catfish whatever 
then that's pretty straightforward to manage because you put fish in, you may feed them, you may take some out, but but it's just you're just trying to maintain that one population of fish. As soon as you add in more than one, then they start eating each other, interacting with that, with mm -hmm. each other, and it becomes a lot more complex to manage. And and the bass bluegill or or bass sunfish sort of scenario is is very common and and one that's recommended because. It's still relatively easy to manage. You've got a couple of players there, and and it provides good opportunities. But you know, I speak to people who are who want to th introduce crappie and walleye mm -hmm. and perch and all these other things where it becomes almost impossible to keep that in a balanced state. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it, the predator prey interactions is is really an important part of fish management. Yeah, absolutely. And you know the the bass bluegill uh, scenario. As we know from experience, a lot of people have been doing this for a long time. It's just much more predictable. So that's why I can sit here and tell you about these scenarios that we run into. And then, you know, we can talk about what we would do next. Um, and every pond's different. It's not a perfect science all the time. But there's, you know, we know if we do this, you know, most likely it's going to change into this way. When you start to introduce crappie, um, and, you know, even at trying to add other predators, uh, it just gets trickier. It, it's a lot less predictable. And so, um, but yeah, predator prey ratios is something we're always looking at what, you know, all the way down to the very first stocking that goes in the pond. That's something based on their goals. We'll shift that predator prey ratio, you know, based on what they're trying to achieve. But, you know, the more you have in the pond, a lot of times, the more fun it is, you just have to you know, you have to keep in mind, it's just, le it's less predictable. Um, and so when you start to put in, you know, walleye, a lot of people do hybrid striped bass, all that stuff can be done, but it can, you know, it can go off the rails and you can be doing some corrective management, um, you know, if, if you're not careful. So it's just stuff to keep in mind. It's not to say that you can't do it, mm -hmm. um, but it just comes with added, uh, you know, a lot of times added management potentially. And I think, you know, as people are thinking about their goals and, and some of these fish scenarios, you know, I, th I think you're right. It, t it takes more management. And so that means mm -hmm. more of your time, potentially more money. And that's great if you have that to invest. But I think it's important right. to know that upfront. You know, you if you say, well, I want a pond with six species in it, but then you yeah. don't realistically have the time or money to put towards that, then it's you're not going to end up getting any of the goals that you want. And right um, mm -hmm. yep now i think we've got a sense of of what you know some of the scenarios that we get in in common ponds or, or some of the things you're looking for but how do you actually go about managing fish you know you've 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 got the data you've got you figure out okay it's it's i've got this stunted population or i've got that you know what do you do to actually fix that right right so yeah, there's a lot, lot, to, lot we could cover there. The easiest way might be to just continue with the bass crowded, mm -hmm. um, and just use that kind of as an example. Um, and then you know, there's hopefully people, you know, stuff people can glean from, from that. So, you know, so we'll go back to having bass crowded. Um, the middle, middle size classes of your bluegill are very scarce. Um, you know, you have a small group of pretty healthy bluegill, very few, um, you know, larger bass. And then a lot of times what I kind of hinted at, a lot of times what we'll see is very few real small, like new reproduction of largemouth even because a lot of times they're eating their own fry. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we've found. And so that's kind of the scenario we'll, we'll go off of. So the common you know, the number one recommendation there is harvest. And so I, I don't know if you get, you could do a whole podcast on harvest. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and we, but we it's might just have something, to, you know, we'll have to get you yeah. back maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right. Happy to do it. Um, so yeah, you just, you have to harvest. It's something, especially bass harvest is something a lot of people struggle, um, struggle to wrap their head around just from the bass, you know, the tournament industry and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a whole culture of catch and release, um, which makes a lot of sense. And, you know, big fisheries that are getting pounded by fishermen. And even this past year with COVID, I mean, there were, there were just, you know, records broken across the country, how many fishing licenses and all that kind of stuff. So there is, there's a place for that. But in your private pond, when there's very few people fishing, um, you're kind of left to, 
to manipulate and manage that and bass harvest, bluegill harvest, that kind of stuff has to be done. Um, and so, you know, in the bass crowded scenario, we would, we would tell you probably lay off the bluegill harvest a little bit if you can. I mean, it doesn't hurt to, you know, bluegill reproduce a lot. Um, so you can, you can have a pretty heavy harvest on bluegill, but if you're in a bass crowded scenario, we would prefer you focus on the bass. If you want to make a mess of fish or whatever, go catch the bass um, and that kind of thing. So that would be number one. Uh, a good starting point for that is around 25 pounds per acre um, of largemouth, whether whatever size it is. But if you're in a bass crowded scenario, a lot of times they're stunted in one size range. So, you know, focus on that size range. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you know you can take it an e even step further and you can start weighing and measuring your bass and you can harvest based on relative weight um, to try to promote the better fish that know you know have it figured out out there for whatever reason whatever reason whether that's genetics or just behavioral traits uh you know some fish in your pond are going to have a better relative weight and some even in a balanced scenario you're going to have some poor individuals you're going to have some average and some that are doing really well so if you're really trying to get into it, you can try to use relative weight, but just focusing on that overcrowded s section is going to help a lot too. Um, so not only, you know, harvest, I think, you know, I think harvest makes a lot of sense. You know, you've got too many bass. That's, that's the problem you're faced with you. So you want to get rid of some of them. That'll help, um, you know, that'll help give more food to that bass at the left and it'll right. help, you know, stop that heavy pr predation pressure on that mid range bluegill. I, um, that's, you might make an interesting point about, you know, you, if you, if you're interested in, and you're, um, and you want to, you could intentionally harvest the ones with poor relative weight because, yeah. you know, like you said, that, that might be removing some gen Brilliant. some bad, some, some inferior genetics out of your pond. Right. Yeah. That I hadn't thought of that. That's a good, a good recommendation. Yep. Yeah. And so there's a, I was going to save it to the, till the end, but there's an app called the smart fish app that will actually allow you, they only have it for uh it's a private pond and lake company down in south carolina i think mm -hmm. that came up with it um and the guy basically it's an app you can measure your bass plug in the length and the weight and it'll tell you the relative weight okay um, they only have That's it neat. for largemouth right now but i use it a lot of times standing there going through the fish during the surveys um, and so I'll show that to a customer. And so that way they can visually see, okay, this is what an 80% relative weight fish looks like. You can see it's got a bigger mouth. It's skinny, you know, plug this in here. Um, I don't know how many, you know, it's, it gets to be tedious measuring and weighing every fish. Um, I talk to a lot of people about that idea and I don't know how many <laughs> are always doing it. There's properties where we'll take the time to do it. Uh, you know, if we're ba coming back to do a survey, we, you know, we're doing, going through all the, the measuring and weighing anyway. So I'll have a sheet there and says, oh, that one's pretty bad. Let's take him out while we're here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think long term that can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, and that so, you know, I guess the, you know, the takeaway is, you know, do some harvest. If you want to go the step further and focus on relative right. rates, you can do it. But but any harvest is better than none. Yes, and, absolutely. And um, and so if they, you know, if, if, they, if a, a pond owner was in that situation, they harvested these bass at 25 pounds per acre or something like that. How long should they expect to, to wait until they start to see a response in their pond? Uh, it's hard to say. So even, even the 25 pounds per acre is not, um, you know, that's almost, we use that as kind of a maintenance. Okay. Uh, so okay. if you're, if you're in a really tough situation, you'll probably, you know, you could go higher than that, but some ponds that are, you know, if a pond's a little bit less productive, you know, even taking 10 pounds per acre uh, each year is better than, than taking none. And you can see some differences. Um, but really the, the big picture, I guess what we should cover before we go too deep any, any further, what we're trying to accomplish in the bass crowded scenario to push it back towards uh, a balance is we're trying to reduce the predators. We're trying to get the bluegill population to rebound, right? So we, we want that missing size class of bluegill three to six inches. We, we need to rebound that right there. We need the bluegill to be, you know, the population to be, you know, filled from zero inches all the way up to, you know, whatever you can get your top end to be eight, 
10 inches, whatever. But that middle size class is extremely important. It's the most common to disappear. So that's what we're trying to do. Everything from this point is trying to accomplish that goal, re, you know, get the bluegill to rebound. Um, and so harvest is number one. Um, it can take some time, you know, you want to, you, you should be harvesting bass year after year, even in a balanced scenario. Um, so, you know, you can really put it on them, um, and, you know, start to see the, the bluegill, you know, hopefully start to see more bluegill around the edges, like I was saying, and, and that kind of thing. One thing we do, and this comes back to, you know, how fast you want to get it if you have the resources to spend. But if you're only harvesting, you're relying on the bluegill to naturally uh, rebound themselves, right? Which mm -hmm. they will, if you keep at it year after year, um, they'll get there. Uh, and you'll start to see with less, you know, predators out there, you'll start to see your relative weight start to tick up a little bit. But, you know, when we get a customer that is really in a hurry to get things going, we'll speed the process up by stocking bluegill at the same time. And so what we try to do is flip that whole fishery on its head. We're going to hit the bass as hard as we can. <clears throat> and then we're going to do a, you know, another bluegill stocking, which isn't, you know, like I said, bluegill reproduce a bunch, you know, you don't think as that's as something to, uh, that you would need to stock. But if you, if you can flip that fishery on its head right away, it's going to speed things up and you're going to, you're really going to, uh, speed the whole process up. But if you don't harvest, <laughs> that's basically just going to be money down the drain. So mm -hmm. you really have to, you got to, you know, do the things in the right order, mm -hmm. um, and that kind of thing. So, uh, another one is, <clears throat> is habitat. And so one, one really common way that you end up in this scenario is to not have any protective habitat in your pond. And so that allows the largemouth to very easily catch the bluegill. Uh, and so you're not protecting very many, if any of those, you know, the bluegill fry, the offspring. So that's something we see, you know, paired with harvest and some other stuff. The habitat can make a big difference. Uh, I know you guys did a whole podcast on that with Sandy, mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about protective habitat versus a fish attractor, you know, is important to think about. If you're just throwing one, you know, one or two pieces of structure out there, have really big openings in between the arms and that kind of stuff, you're really not protecting a whole lot of fish. Mm -hmm. You might give them something to congregate around, but in this bass crowded scenario, you want to focus your efforts on protective, actually protective habitat that has a lot of small spaces. Uh, a lot of times we'll put the, we'll put that right around a bluegill bed. So like we'll, and which is another, another recommendation in this, scenario is a spawning a bluegill spawning bed which goes back to how do we rebound the bluegill mm -hmm. right so we'll put a pea gravel bluegill spawning bed out there to provide better or more spawning habitat and then we'll surround it with protective habitat that way when those fry hatch they have a place to feed right out in and be protected where a lot of times people's you know spawning beds are kind of like their beaches and so there's nothing there's nothing around and so when those bluegill spawn it was probably successful but it was very easy for those fry to get you know eaten by the bass and so uh, habitat is a big one as well uh, whether you do artificial you know use the cedar trees all that stuff that you guys covered already mm -hmm. um, but that's that's a big one that we focus on so harvest you can restock bluegill if you really want to speed things up and then habitat are three uh, three of the main ones that we talk to people about a lot. Great. I think that's a great overview of how you might go about remedying that specific scenario, that scenario that's pretty common. And, and I think if you think about some of those processes, you know, the harvest helps free up resources. Uh, it helps uh, limit predation pressure. And then you think about reproductive success, habitat, and then potential yep. stocking. If you think about think about those broader concepts, which is which we've spoken about before, 
you can apply that to other scenarios in a pond. If you have a bluegill yep. stunted pond, then just think about some of those processes. And, you know, we, we address some of those scenarios in, in some of our publications too. But mm-hmm. I mean, right. thinking about, you know, those harvest habitat stocking as, as some tools for managing fish, I think can, you can apply that to multiple situations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we'll we'll definitely have to have you back after field season is over to talk about mm-hmm. all the different harvesting techniques and what people right. can do with their fish once they yep. once they're harvested. But do you have any recommendations for favorite podcasts or magazines like you mentioned um, that sparked your interest in high school, mm-hmm. or <clears throat> or books that you've read that people can can look for more fisheries related information? Right. Um, so yeah, that smart fish app would be one to, to check out, even if you're not going to do it every time, if you would just go fish and do it, you know, spend a day, catch a bunch of, and like I said, they all, I thought they were going to start adding more species. They haven't yet, but if you just go catch a bunch of bass and measure and weigh them, you'll get to figure out a rough estimate. You know, yeah. when you catch a large mouth, that's a hundred percent relative weight. It looks like a nice fish, you know, looks drastically different than something that's at a 70 80 percent relative weight and so you'll get you know you'll start to you know figure that kind of stuff out so that's something to check out um there's a facebook page i think i had it written down here called lake and pond management questions content and community um it's a little bit newer there's there's a lot of uh private pond and lake management professionals in there uh, that'll answer questions um a lot of it it, anymore i think is just people who have ponds people that are experimenting um you know so you'll want to take you know take everything with a grain of salt a lot of the people in there are just you know they're trying stuff themselves they're making Mm -hmm. artificial structure and all that kind of stuff but there's you know, there's a lot of ideas that are thrown around out there. Um, so you don't, you know, so just keep that in mind, but there, there's a lot to see and kind of see what people are doing across the country out, you know, on that page is kind of interesting. And then we have a YouTube channel, um, that you might check out. We try to do, uh, some educational stuff. And then we have some other, you know, videos covering some of the services that we do, but, we have kind of initial stocking, um, short video and on fish feeding and stuff, a lot of stuff that you guys will cover, you know, doing this podcast, Mm -hmm. but, um, so that's kind of, you know, might be something for people to check out too. Awesome. Thanks Wes. Yeah. We'll link to all of those things down in our show notes too. Cool. Um, and so I guess I got to ask, you know, you're, you're going out to these ponds and you get to do a lot of shocking, see a lot of fish, you know, now it's your time to impress us. What are some of the biggest <laughs> bass or the biggest uh, bluegill you've seen in some of the ponds that you've worked on? Yeah, so um, we did a, a survey out in Missouri um, this past spring. Spring surveys are fun if you're talking about bass because you, if when you hit the spawn right, I mean, it's just everywhere you go, you're rolling up male and female, you know, together. And, and so we, we did a survey um, – I haven't rolled any 10 pound fish yet. We haven't done a whole lot of, um, a lot of times when people call us, it's because they're, you know, they've got issues, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, so then yeah. we got to <laughs> fix it. And then by the time it gets to be awesome, they're like, I don't need you anymore. <laughs> um, so, but there's places that have, uh, you know, we've rolled up seven, eight pounders and stuff. And that, a lot of that's just in the Midwest where our Tennessee office is pretty new where you can start to, play around with the Florida strain Mm -hmm. or F1, you know, some, do some, you know, really try to do some, um, you know, some fun stuff if, but you got to find the right client. A lot of people don't truly want a trophy fishery because Mm -hmm. you have to reduce the bass population so much that, and there's so much food out there for those fish that they're hard to catch. Mm -hmm. And like, Mm -hmm. there's just not a lot of them out there. Right. So, um, that's something, you know, for people to keep in mind that most people don't truly want a true trophy fishery for that reason. Um, bluegill, uh, really we, we kind of developed our own fish food, which is a whole nother topic, but so we've been kind of following that. Um, and my, and my dad's look, he's got a little third acre pond. There's not, it's got a leak in the dam. There's not a whole, you know, it's a tough situation. So 
that's where, you know, one of several scenarios where a feeder can come into play and kind of prop up a fishery, um, you know, just to provide for the grandkids and stuff. And so my daughter caught a one pound bluegill this past fall. My dad caught one through the ice the other day. And if you see a one pound bluegill, that is a impressive fish. (laughs) (laughs) Like I said, I'm a bass fisherman. Um, but if you can catch a mess of one pound bluegill, that's, that's fun no matter who you are in my yeah. opinion <laughs> absolutely yeah. awesome well uh thanks a lot for your time wes it's been uh, yeah. very informative and and uh you know we'll definitely have to get you on again and it's it's been great hearing about your uh your story about how you got to where you are now and it's um yeah i'm glad glad you had some good times at purdue i've you know, it's been great having you on i uh, hope you have a, a fun and productive uh season ahead hopefully it's it's um it's more back to normal than 2020 was absolutely and uh, yeah happy to happy to do this anytime you got any other topics uh as you just found out i can ramble about all of it (laughs) because i enjoy doing it awesome yeah well thanks wes well that was a great episode um i think at this point i i want to remind everybody that we have uh, a couple of publications on fish fish management out there we have one on fish stocking um, but then we have one uh, comprehensive document on fish management and we go into all these sorts of things like predation and balancing fish populations and, and how to use harvest and, and the importance of habitat. So we'll make sure to link to that. And we also have a, a template document that actually allows you to help build a management plan. It talks about setting goals and, and the types of data you need to collect from your fish and then making decisions based on those. So. Um, so that ties into a lot of what we spoke about and, and we'll make sure we link to those in the, so, in the show notes. And I'll also put in a plug for AFS, the American Fisheries Society at Purdue. Um, so when Wes and I were students, and I know that they've done it since then, we were, we were contracted um, to do surveys for pond and lake owners, like private pond and lake owners. And so if you, if you want to do that, if you want to have your your pond survey, write it, get a report written on, on what they found. Um, I would suggest reaching out to Mitch because <laughs> yeah, he is their advisor, but that's, that's another way to, um, get some students some experience and then also get your pond surveyed and maybe, maybe they do it on an annual basis. And then you've got someone else that can, that can, um, take over some of that monitoring for you. Yeah, absolutely. As Megan said, I'm the advisor of that club and there the club is always looking for opportunities to get out and do some hands-on fish management stuff and and yeah, we we we'll occasionally take our um, electro fishing boat and our equipment out and and do some pond surveys for for communities or landowners and and if you're interested in that um, and you know, you can always send me an email and we can we can discuss that further. So, so what, um, you know, we, we both know Wes pretty well and we've worked with Wes, but what was something interesting that you learned from that episode? I think, I guess the most interesting thing is, um, aquatic control. And when I had learned about aquatic control years ago, they were, they focused on vegetation and to see him like go in and he's managing their whole, managing their entire fisheries operation. That's really cool. And so knowing now that these different these different locations, the seven locations mm-hmm. around the state and around the Midwest have that fisheries um, component is is really 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 neat. Yeah, and I think um, yeah, it's it's been great seeing West carve out that that niche for him with them, and and they do some great stuff with with vegetation and now with fish, and I think mm-hmm. the the value of of a private company like them or, or, you know, a company just like them close to where you live is that they can really work with you individually and and figure out the best for your needs. Like a lot, a lot, what we do with this podcast and with our publications is provide sort of general advice that works in a lot of general situations. Mm -hmm. But as, as we've spoken about before, every pond is different. Every, the goals of the pond owners are different. And if you really want to get into managing for some of the, you know, managing for trophy fish or managing some different species or, or getting an assessment done, you know, that's where these companies can really um, provide some some great services for the landowners. So awesome. Well, I think that just about does it for this episode. Um, I want to remind you to like and subscribe to this podcast. Check out all the, the links in the show notes. We have a, a survey in there that if you've been listening to our podcast and you like it, 
or if you don't like it for that matter, <laughs> um, please take that survey. It takes just a couple of minutes and it really gives us some good feedback on, on what to provide in future podcasts and what to change to make it better. Um, I also want to remind you, if you haven't seen on our social media accounts, that we now have a YouTube channel for Natural Resources University where you can listen to all of these um, all of these episodes on YouTube if, if that's what you prefer. But we're also linking to additional uh, video content up there as well that will demonstrate some of the things that we speak about on this podcast. Yep. And we're a part of a wider network. So if you're interested in deer and habitat and fire, you can learn about that too. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, um, we had a lot of fun again and uh, we'll see you all for the next episode. Awesome. Bye. Cheerio. Pond University is hosted by Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Pond University is part of the podcast network Natural Resources University, which is supported by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you liked Pond University, then check out the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University podcast network. Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant are equal opportunity, equal access, and affirmative action institutions. Thank you.